Amen. The Lord is near, and He is here. And we thank Him for that. Thank Him for His presence. We don't have to beg and plead with Him to be here with us. He's promised uh, to be with us today. And, and I want you to take your Bibles, if you would, and be finding Psalm 23. And if you've got an extra ribbon in your Bible, turn, turn to 2 uh, Corinthians uh, as well. We'll be in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You can put a piece of paper or ribbon there and that'll help you find that a little bit quicker when we get there. Psalm 23. We've been in this series now for a few weeks and we've just been taking a, really about a verse a week and doing what the Selah, we talked about that pause, that reflection, that time of meditation and that's what we've been doing as we've been taking our time going through this beautiful and wonderful psalm. So follow along with me, Psalm 23 and verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. Note that declaration. The Lord is my shepherd. Because of that, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, and He leads me beside the quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me or leads me in the paths of righteousness. For his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And you have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We said in the week one, this is probably, it's not just one of the most popular psalms, it's probably one of the most popular passages of Scripture in the entire Bible. Uh, people know this psalm, and the verse we're going to be focusing on today is verse 4, and he talks about going through the valley of the shadow of death, and, and I can tell you that I have read this psalm many times in a hospital room where individuals were lying on their deathbed, and they were about to physically and literally, I guess, not figuratively the way some of the pictures we read in the psalms, but they were about to go through the actual valley of the shadow of death, and, and certainly I've seen this psalm bring comfort and strength and peace when there is some uncertainty and questions and, and, and all those things that would normally and naturally come, but the devil who would want to bring fear and anxiety to the child of God, the, the, the Lord is our shepherd, man. He says, he, he, his rod and his staff, he's going to comfort us, and we'll talk about that today, but what peace and what contentment and what joy this psalm brings. You know, we don't, we don't really like to talk about death. As a matter of fact, when the, that subject comes up, we just kind of, um, man, we just put it off as though it's something way, 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 way out there. And that doesn't matter if we're 7 or 70. We still think it's way, 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 way out there. And so we don't really want to talk about it. But the Bible says it's appointed unto men wants to die. And really, uh, 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 today's language maybe. A uh, way of saying that would be, our death is on God's date book. Did you know that? Have you, that's sobering to think about it. But the day of your death is on, and you're not going to be late. <laughs> you're going to be right on time. He knows where it's going to happen. He knows when it's going to happen. He knows how it's going to happen. And it's going to happen. Unless there's only one exception, and that's the rapture of the church. And I'm going to tell you what. And these days, I've been thinking more and more and more about the rapture of the church because we are so quickly and so fast approaching the end of days. And I don't know if it'll be my generation or my children's generation, but I'm telling you, I think, I think there's going to be some maybe living right now that's going to escape death through the rapture because of, of the way things are happening. I'm telling you what, the things that are going on the, on the political scene uh, on the geopolitical scene with, uh, with the nation of Israel and all the things going on there with Iran and our hand in that now with this Iranian so-called nuclear deal and, and where we have obligated ourselves to protect Iran if Israel ever attacks uh, Iran. How ludicrous is that? But listen, God is on His throne. 
And he said these things were happening, and they're, they're happening before our very eyes. And so we're very quickly and swiftly approaching, it seems, the end of days. I'm not a date setter, but I'm just saying it could happen. And are you ready? Because <laughs> death's coming. But it's happening. And in the end, we need to understand there is an end, okay? And our appointment with death is real. You know, the Bible says, prepare to meet your God. Now, when we, when we say prepare to meet your God, he's not talking about going down to the funeral home and picking out the flowers you want to lay on your casket and picking out the casket and, 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 and picking out the songs. And When he says prepare to meet your God, that's not what he's talking about. All we're doing when we do those things is we're trying to make death as pretty as it can be. You know, so it kind of somehow helps us cope with it. That's not what he's talking about. There's a great verse that I think he has in mind, Psalm 90 and verse 12. It says, teach us how short our lives really are so that we may be wise. That is, teach us to number our days, that we have a set number of days. And listen, my number of days might be longer or shorter than yours and vice versa, but we need to know that there's this thing called the brevity of life. And because of the brevity of life, we need to have a heart of wisdom. And what happens is when we learn that our days are short, and by that I mean, listen, I don't care if you live 75, 85, 90 years compared to eternity. It, it's short. Our days are short. There's this thing called the brevity of life. And when we understand that, God says we're going to have a heart of wisdom. And what that means is we're going to have our priorities lined up. We're not going to be saturated with the things of this world, running all over the place, having our focus. Man, listen, I'm telling you, we're all looking around, and we need to be looking up because he's coming. He's coming soon, and so we need to be ready for that. So when the Bible says prepare to meet your God, he's saying understand the brevity of life that you might have a heart of wisdom, that is to get your life uh, in the proper perspective and have the priorities uh, you need to have. The best way to face life, honestly, is to be honest about death. Adrian Rogers put it this way. He said, a man is not ready to live until he's first ready to die. And that's true. That's true. You're not ready to live. Your focus is going to be wrong. Your priorities are going to be wrong. You are not ready to live until you're first ready to die. Now, look at verse 4 with me again. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they come from me. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Now, did you know there is such a valley? I'm talking about literal. This isn't, this isn't figurative. This is literal. There's a literal valley, and it's called literally the valley of the shadow of death. It's there in Israel. And by the way, Marcia and I have been there. And, and hey, if you want to go with us, the Lord doesn't come before then. I can't think, think of a better place to be than over there when he comes. But anyway, we're going to go in March. And listen, that's a bucket list thing, amen? I mean, you say, man, I just would like to go one of these days. Man, this is your opportunity. So if you want to go with us, you can go. We'll go in those caves, and we'll get in those valleys, and we'll see all of that stuff. And, and who knows, this may be your last opportunity. So I want you to go if you can. So there's some information on the welcome desk about our trip to Israel next spring. Now, there is this valley. We've been there. We've seen that valley. And so what happens is it starts there between Jerusalem and Bethlehem up about 2,700 feet Above sea level, there's some water, and sometimes that water trickles and sometimes it gushes, but it comes down, and it goes down, 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 and through the years, this water has cut a chasm, if you will, a, a valley, a, a canyon, if you will, of ravines, if you will. It's just cut through there, as rock can do over centuries of time, and so it's come down, and so that water starts at 2,700 feet above sea level, and it comes down, 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 down to about 1,300 feet below sea level as it flows into the Dead Sea. Now, uh, Marcy and I have been to the Dead Sea, and we floated in the Dead Sea. You say, I can't float. You can float in the Dead Sea because there's so much salt in there. Nothing lives. You don't have to worry about anything biting your toes or nipping at you because nothing lives in there. It's all dead, okay? And so, but there's this valley, and it's a, uh, and they call it the valley of the shadow of death. Why death? Well, because first of all, the water flows down to the Dead Sea and nothing lives there, okay? And another reason they call it the valley of the shadow of death is because in some places on this, this, this chasm, it's so narrow. The rocks on either side are, are sometimes only 12 feet apart. I, I got a picture here I want to show you. And this, this is just 
I don't know if this is actually the valley of the shadow of death, but this, is, this would be similar. And so there's this chasm. You see the canyon, if you will, and there's certain places. There's a couple of pictures, but I didn't think they'd show up as good. But it was, it was like 12 feet across. And so you can imagine, it doesn't matter what time of day. I mean, if, 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 if it's only 12 feet across, no matter how the sun's hitting it, there's basically going to be shadows somewhere, right? Unless it's high noon, straight up, and it's coming straight down, that'd be the only way. But then rocks still jet out and so forth. But there were constantly shadows, no matter the time of day, in this valley. And so it's called the valley of the shadow of death. Now, another reason it was called this valley of the shadow of death by the shepherds was because there were dangerous places. You can just imagine. There were bears, there were hyenas, there were coyotes, there were and not only wild animals, but there were uh, thugs, thieves, people who would hang out in those caves, and, and uh, we'd been some of those caves, and we'd crawl up in there, and they would just hide out and wait for someone to come through, to travel through, and, and they, would, they would rob you and steal from you and so on and so forth. So the shepherds, for all those and maybe many more reasons, this valley, they called it the valley of the shadow of death. Now, it really had a, um, a good side to it in that it was a very helpful, helpful thing. For instance, during the winter, you know, you're up in the high elevation. You, during the winter, you can't, it's too cold. There's not really any grass, you know, you know like our winters. I mean, there's just no grass. And, and so what the shepherds would do, they would get in that valley, and they would, they would, go, they would lead their sheep down, down, down to the, the lower areas where there was grass and something to eat, the greener pastures, if you will. And, and so they would eat until... Listen, those fields would be barren. And during, if it's rainy season or dry season, those, that grass would dry up and wither up. About springtime, when it starts warming up up here, man, all these hills begin to, to, to send forth their, uh, the grass and the vegetation, so on and so forth. So the shepherd would take those sheep again, and he would march them right back up that valley, back up to the highlands where the green pastures of the, the mountainsides would be. And so he, depending on the time of year, he was taking them up or taking them down uh, to greener pastures. I really like the way um, Max Licato describes this. So bear with me and let me read a couple of paragraphs. He says, he puts it this way in his book on Psalm 23. Summer in ancient Palestine, a woolly bunch of bobbin heads follow the shepherd out of the gate. The morning sun has scarcely crested the horizon and he is already leading his flock. Like every other day, he guides them through the gate and out into the fields. But unlike most days, the shepherd will not return home tonight. He will not rest on his bed, and the sheep will not sleep in their fenced-in pasture. This is the day the shepherd takes the sheep to the high country. Today, he leads his flock to the mountains. He has no other choice. Springtime grazing has left the pasture bare, so he must seek new fields. With no companion other than his sheep and no desire other than their welfare, he leads them to the deep grass on the hillsides. The shepherd and his flock will be gone for weeks, perhaps months. They will stay well into the autumn until the grass is gone and the chill is unbearable. But not all shepherds make this journey. The trek is long. The path is dangerous. Poisonous plants can infect the flock. Wild animals can attack the flock. There are narrow trails and dark valleys. Some shepherds... Choose the security of the barren pastures below, but not the good shepherd. He knows the path. He has walked this trail many times. Besides, he's prepared, staff in hand and rod attached to his belt. With the staff, he will nudge the flock, and with the rod, he will protect and lead the flock. He will lead them to the mountains. And what the shepherd does with the flock, our shepherd will do with us. He will lead us to the high country as well. When the pasture is bare down here, God will lead us up there. He will guide us through the gate, out of the flatlands, and up the path of the mountain. Someday our shepherd will do the same with us. He will take us to the mountain by way of the valley. He will guide us to his house through the valley of the shadow of death. No doubt David had this journey, had made this journey many times as a shepherd in those Judean hills. Without a doubt, this is what he had in mind when he wrote Psalm 23 and verse 4. Here in a nutshell, let me, we've read it from the scriptures. Let me just paraphrase what David is saying in verse 4. Here's what he's saying. The Lord is to me 
what I have been to my sheep. He will do for me what I have done for my sheep. I have led the sheep through the valley of the shadow of death, and the Lord will do the same for me. And so he's talking, sometimes we say that's poetic, but he's talking literally, as he has literally and physically led his sheep to to the greener pastures and the higher plains. God is going to do that for you and I when we face this thing called death. Now, let's look at three things. First of all, think with me about this. Death is definite. We're going to have three truths about death. Number one, death is definite. And, and by that, I mean it's going to happen. Notice, the, notice what that verse says. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow, even though I do it. In other words, he doesn't say even though I might walk through the valley of the shadow of death or even though I could walk through the valley of the shadow of death. No, he says I'm going to do it. If you have a King James Version, it says Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Not nay, as in no, but yea, as in yes, I'm going to do it. So death is, is a definite thing. I mean, as we said a moment ago, the only exception is the rapture. I mean, that's the only exception. In the end, there is an end, and it's death. And so we need to understand death is definite. You know, the Bible says our lives are like a vapor. You know, it's hard to imagine it today on these 100-degree days, but on, on a cold winter's day, you know, you can go out and you see your breath, right? It, but you only see it for a second or two, three at the most, and boom, it's gone. He's saying our lives are like that vapor. It's here for a short while, but then it's gone. It just disappears. That's the way our life is. Death is definite. It's going to happen. Number two, second truth. Death is not only definite, but death is a door. The valley of the shadow of death was really a passageway for the sheep to enter another pasture. They left one pasture, they went through this valley, through this door, if you will, into another place, into another pasture. It's just like these doors. We have doors. We're in this room, but if we go through that door, we, it's a passageway from this room to that room. That's what doors are. Death is a door. It is a passageway from this life to the next life. The Bible is very, very clear that death is a door. Now, we need to understand, to understand the door of death, we need to understand there are really three kinds of death in the Bible. Now, and by the way, death just means separation. Because isn't that what it is? I mean, if you've had a loved one die, you're separated from them, right? You can't go be with them. You can't call them up on the phone. You can't take them to, out to dinner because death has made a separation. So there are three kinds of death, three kinds of separation. You know, the Bible says the wages, the wages of sin is death. Another translation might say, literally, the wages of sin is separation. And that's what it is. Sin has separated us from God. So there's, the wages of sin is a separation. There are three kinds of death, three kinds of separation. Okay, number one, there's physical death. Physical death. Now, we're familiar with that in that we've had loved ones who have, who have gone through this door of death. And when that happens, there is a separation. What's the separation through physical death? Well, the body and the soul are separated from, I mean, the soul and the spirit are separated from the body at the physical death, right? Because we'll have a funeral and that body will be there. The body is there, but their soul and their spirit is not there. At physical death, there's a separation between the soul and the spirit and the body. Our body is like a house. It's like a motel. We live in it on this earth. But listen, at death, we go through that door and we check out of this body, okay? That's what happens at the physical death, the physical separation. Number two, there's spiritual death. Now, Ephesians 2 talks about how our sin separates us from God. We said the wages of sin is separation or death. You know, God told Adam and Eve, the day you eat of that fruit, you will die. And he said, and listen, you know what, literally, the day they ate of it, did they die physically that day? No. Because he was saying, yes, death is coming, but what you've done is now you, because of your sin and your disobedience, you have the fellowship that was there, you've made a separation. Sin has made a separation. That's the spiritual death. And listen, by the way, we're born physically alive but spiritually dead. You understand that, right? Would you say amen if you understand that? 
We're born physically alive, but we're born spiritually dead. We are born separated from God. We have to be reunited with Him through the cross of Christ. Our sin has to be punished. Our sin has to be dealt with. That's what Jesus did on the cross. And so while we were at enmity with God, while we were separated from God, because of Christ and His cross, now we can be reunited because we are spiritually dead. We are spiritually separated, okay? So the first kind of death is physical death. second kind of death is spiritual death. The third kind of death is eternal death. The Bible talks about eternal death. And there's a great verse. It's Revelation 20, verse 14, and here's what it says. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire, and this is the second death, the lake of fire. And so here, here's the thing. We have a physical death, which is a physical separation. The body is separated from the soul and the spirit. And then there's the spiritual death, whereby because sin has entered this world and we're born into sin, we are separated from God. Now listen, here's the thing. This is why it's so critical. Even what I'm sharing with you today is critical. Eternity hangs in the balance. Because if you're here and you know not Christ and you've never received Christ, you are still spiritually dead. And if you go through the door of death from this life into the next life, separated spiritually, you'll be separated eternally from God. That's what the Bible clearly teaches all throughout it. So there's physical death, there's spiritual death, there is eternal death. Now, that's permanent separation. I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians for just a moment. 2 Corinthians 5, and I want us to look at the first few verses of that chapter because I think what we see here it gives us a good idea of what is really beyond the door. Door death is a door, it's a passageway. And it's, it's telling us very clearly. I'm going to show you some of the erroneous things people believe about what's beyond death's door. But here's what the Bible says is beyond death's door. Okay, so 2 Corinthians 5. Follow along as I begin reading in verse 1. Now, by the way, he mentions the earthly tent and the earthly house and those kinds of uh, that figurative language. He's talking about our bodies. Okay, when he says the earthly tent, he's talking about not a literal earthly tent. He's talking about our body. Okay, so let's look at it. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1. For we know that if the earthly tent, that is our body, which is our house, which is our body, is torn down, that is we die, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And he's talking about we have a house. Now, he's not necessarily talking about God's house. Like we think of God has a house, a place called heaven. He's talking about a, a heavenly body, a glorified body. Okay, he goes on to, to uh, elaborate. Verse 2, for indeed in this house, that is in this body, we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. What does he mean, not be found naked? He's talking about our spirit, our soul is going to have a body. Here we have this body. You're looking at my house. You're looking at my earthly tent. I'm looking at yours. But when we leave, when we go through death, we're going to be given, as believers, we're going to be given another body. We're not going to be naked. Our and I'm talking about the physical sin. I'm talking about our soul and our spirit is going to have a house. We have this house on this side of eternity. We're going to have a glorified house, a glorified body on that side of eternity. That's what he's talking about in verse 3. For indeed, while we are in this tent, in this house, we groan. Let me ask you something. Do you groan in this tent? Do you groan in your body? Man, I'm telling you, I do more groaning now than I've ever done in my life. It's getting worse. Just groan and grunt. I don't even know what I'm doing. Marcy, you're just groaning. You're grunting. I, I don't know. I didn't know. I, well, I, I'm hurting. There's something wrong. And, and it's because of the stress and the burdens and the trials of this life. He says, in this house we groan, being burdened, because we don't want to be unclothed but to be clothed. In other words, we, we don't want to die because we want, we want to keep our house. We want to keep this body. But listen, he says, look at this, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now, verse 5, now he who has prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave to us the Spirit as a pledge. In other words, he's saying, listen, you're going to check out of your house one day. You're going to die. But I'm going to tell you something. What I'm going to do now for you as a believer, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is coming to our heart to remind us as a pledge, really, that we have a, listen, we have another house. It's not made with hands. We, we, we have a glorified body waiting for us. And how, the reason we know that is God says, I'm giving you the Holy Spirit as a pledge to let you know that it is certain, it is true. Therefore, verse 6, 
being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, that is, while we're alive, man, we're absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. But we are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather, look at this, to be absent from the body so that we might be at home with the Lord. You see that? He's saying, so he's saying there's this separation. When we check out of this body, we go to be with the Lord, and we get a glorified body one of these days. And so he's saying it's better to be absent from this body. Well, we've never latched on to that just yet. It's better to be absent from this body so that we might be at home with the Lord. I think about old Keith Green. He was a music songwriter. He's the only one I know. I mean, he got up every day, and he prayed. He would pray every night when he went to bed, Lord, take me. Take me tonight. Would you just take me? I, 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 I want to leave this body. I want to leave this earth. I want to, come, I want to be in heaven. I want to be with you. He longed. He, he longed for the Lord. He loved the Lord. He, he looked to the Lord. And he begged every single night when he went to bed, Lord, would you take me tonight? He'd, he'd say in his testimony was when he woke up in the morning, he was just, it was almost like disappointment because he wanted to be with the Lord. Because he knew absent from the body was present with the Lord. That's what he knew. Okay, so that's what this gives us a good picture. But now I want to show, I want to share with you some of the things people erroneous believe about this door called death. Okay, what's beyond that door? Well, here's what our world teaches us. First of all, some people believe in annihilationism. Annihilationism. This is this just means that a person ceases to exist. Death is the absolute end. <clears throat> there's nothing out there. There's no condemnation. There's no judgment. There's no heaven. There's no hell. There's nothing. Their view is, man, listen, you eat, drink, and be merry. If you want to do it, you better do it now. You better just enjoy it because after you die, boom, that's it. No more. You, you cease to exist. Nothing beyond death. Now, that's a great view. If you want to hey, eat, drink, and be merry, and no responsibility, no accountability, that's a great view. The only problem with that view is there's not one single verse of Scripture to support that view. Annihilationism. A lot of people believe that. It's the way they escape it. Number two, reincarnation. Now, this is where people, you know, we believe, we say that we have to be born again spiritually because we're dead spiritually. We have to be born again spiritually, right? Well, what they say is when you die physically, the reincarnationist says you are born again physically. You die physically and you're born again physically somewhere else, maybe as something else. Uh, we saw this in India. You know, they, they believe they have this caste system and, and where they, they'll say if you're, if you're good in this life and you do a lot of good things and you're, you know, you're a good steward and you make good decisions and so on, so on, so on, and you do all that in this life, when you die, you take a step up. Maybe you get some, a, a life that's more prominent and more influential and blah, blah, blah. But they also say if you don't do anything with this life and you're a poor steward and you make <coughs> poor decisions, and so on, so on, you take a step down. So much so that you may not even come back as a human being. You may come back as an animal. That's why when we were there, they had cows just roaming the streets, and you never told them, shoo, or get out of the way. You never did that. You let them. I saw cows walk into places of business and just walking around, and they let them do it because that, that might have been Uncle Joe. He, he died a couple years ago, and now he's come back. I, I'm sure that's what they believed. Reincarnation. Again, uh, you know, I guess that's a, a, a pretty good view if, if that's what you want to believe. Carl Lung put it this way. He says the concept of reincarnation seems to offer one of the most attractive explanation, uh, explanations of man's origin and destiny. Yeah, I guess it is attractive. I mean, I, if I just mess it up and botch it up, man, I get a big old do-over. Yeah, you play golf and, you, man, you squirrel one down there about 10 yards and, man, you say, man, mulligan, get another ball out and hit it again. You don't get a life mulligan, okay? There's not one shred of Scripture that says that reincarnation is real. Number three, another view is the soul sleep view. I've talked with soul sleepers. I've had arguments with soul sleepers. They just believe that the soul sleep, what they believe is, is that the body disintegrates. As the body dies and it disintegrates, the soul and the spirit just stays right there with the body and goes to sleep. It's a soul sleep is what they call it. Little Timmy was out in the garden in his backyard. He was filling in a big old hole when his neighbor peered over the fence and said, Timmy, what are you doing? 
And Timmy looked up with tears just streaming down his face, and he said, my goldfish died, and I'm burying him. And, I mean, he had this big old mound, and he's patting it down. And, I mean, the thing was a big old mound. And the neighbor said, well, Timmy, that sure is an awful big hole uh, for your goldfish. And Timmy looked up and said, well, he's inside of your cat. <laughs> so, <laughs> But just like that goldfish and that cat were inseparably linked, that's what the soul sleeper says. They say the body and the soul and the spirit are inseparably linked. And the body dies and the soul just stays right there with that disintegrating dead body and just goes to sleep. And they quote a few verses of Scripture. But I want to give you a couple of verses of Scripture that will let you know that that is not what happens when you go through the door of death. It's, you're not going to sleep. The soul is not going to sleep. And that there is, there is a separation between the soul and the spirit uh, and with the body. So let me give you, let me give you uh, uh, three or four reasons why the body and soul are not inseparably linked. Number one, Jesus' words to the thief on the cross. Remember that? Jesus looks to the thief on the cross and, and he says, listen, you're going to die, but in a few, de- in a few years you're going to go to sleep and then you're going you're to be with me maybe two, three, four thousand years from now. You're going to be with me in paradise. Is that what he said? No. He said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Your body's going to die. But today, you're going to be with me in paradise. Jesus' words when he died, he looked at the Father, and he said, did he say, Heavenly Father, I'm going to go to sleep for a little while, and I'll see you later. No, he said, into your hand, I commit my spirit. Not my body, my spirit. Stephen's word when he died, the same words almost of our Lord. When he was being stoned to death in the book of Acts, he looked up to the heavens and he saw the Lord and he said, Lord, in two or three thousand years, I'm going to come and see you. No, he said, into your hand I commend my spirit. Fourthly, Paul's word to the Philippians. We just read it also there in Corinthians. He says, absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so very, very clearly, there is this separation. They are not inseparably linked, okay? So that's the soul sleepers. But then another one, and there's probably many more, but we'll just let this be the last one, the intermediate state. Some people believe that when you die, you kind of go to like a holding area. Marcy works surgery, and they'll take them from your surgical room, and they'll put you in what's called a holding area, and then they'll take you on into surgery later. And so this, some people believe in this intermediate state called a holding area, and they call it purgatory. And what they say is you have to go to this intermediate state to suffer for your sins. And, and so they say you have to be purged from your sins. Jesus, they, they believe, said so Jesus died for most of your sins. Uh, he, he died on the cross, and that took care of most all of it. I don't know, 90% of it, 95% of it, maybe 99% of it. I don't know. But you have to go to purgatory to, take, to suffer for the rest of it. And then you can be cleansed, and then you can leave the holding area, the suffering area, and go on to be with the Lord. So some questions come to mind. How long does this take? Well, we don't know. Well, how, how, how do we get out? Well, we don't know that either. Well, how much suffering do we have to endure? Well, we don't know that either. A lot of things we don't know, but after we're released, we do go to heaven. And I want to tell you something, friend, countless millions of people, of people believe this. They believe, they believe in this intermediate state. When you go through death, that's where you go. You go to purgatory to suffer. What, what, what is that this? I mean, the only thing I can figure, the only thing I've thought about it, I've thought about it, I've read the scriptures they say, so the only thing I can figure that they would really believe that is pure human pride because there's something in all of us who says, I want to do something. I want to contribute something for my salvation, right? I mean, I'm telling you, we do that. We, that's the way we live. If you do something for me, man I, just, man, I just want to do something for you. I can't leave it as a gracious act. I, I have to do so. I have to pay you back. And, and so that's what, that's what pride says. I, I can't accept the fact that he has paid it all. I have to do at least my part. I have to suffer a little bit, and then, boom, it'll be complete. Well, friend, that's not scriptural. Jesus paid it all. He paid it all. All to Him we owe. Not a portion. All to Him we owe. Grace is unmerited favor, undeserved love, plus nothing. Not one thing. 
That's why he said, who's going to boast in front of the Lord? Listen, it's by grace we've been saved through faith, and that not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. It's not a result of anything we do, anything we suffer. Any, it, that, then we would boast. Well, I, I made it. I finished it up for you, Lord. Oh, no. No one's going to boast before the Lord. It's absolutely His grace. When John saw Jesus on the banks of the River Jordan, he looked across at him. He said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away most of the sin of the world. Is that what he said? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the majority of the sin of the world. No, that's not. He said, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin, all of it, of the world. There's no intermediate state. There, there, it's just not there. So the Bible says death is a door. And when we die, we're not annihilated, we're not reincarnated, we're not going to go to sleep, we're not going to go to this holding area called purgatory. Listen, when we die, we're going to live forever. Did you know that? You're going to live forever, and where you live is determined by what you do with Jesus Christ. If you are with Christ, you are going to live forever with God in His presence. That's what the Bible teaches. And if you are without Him, you're going to face that third death. That's the second death, the eternal death, the eternal separation from God, okay? David said, the Lord is my shepherd. He knew the Lord, and because he knew the Lord, death to David, listen to me, death to David was a passageway into the presence of God. Third thing, death is definite, death is a door, and death is defeated. Now, notice what he says. I'm back in Psalm 23, verse 4. He says, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He says, I'm not walking through the valley of death. You'd think he would say that, wouldn't you? If we're going to die, I'm going to walk through the valley of death. No, he says, you're going to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. See, listen, a shadow may frighten you, but a shadow can't hurt you. You know that, right? Shadows don't hurt. Donald Gray Barnhouse, he's a, he's a preacher of yesteryear i've got some of his commentaries in my office i always like reading he he said great illustrations i love illustrations and he he's a great illustrator but anyway when he was he was a younger preacher he had little girls about that high you know just a, just a little girl i'm not sure how old but and she uh his his wife passed away his wife died this little girl's mother died and they were, of course, brokenhearted. And, he, and the little girl grew up in church, and she knew all the things, just like our little kids around here. Man, they know all the stuff. They know all the stuff we tell them in Bible school and Sunday school. And, but it, it, she, it hadn't really found lodging in her heart. She couldn't really put two and two together on it, but she knew all the facts. That's the way this little girl was. Well, it was probably three or four weeks after her, uh, his, his wife's death, this little girl's mama's death. And they're coming out of, de, of, of a department store. And they were walking out, they were walking out of the door. And the little girl, and there was this big truck. I don't know. It, I, I always think of a UPS truck. It probably wasn't a UPS truck. Obviously, it was, it was a long time ago. But anyway, it was, it was a big truck. And the sun was setting. And, and it was, it was kind of late in the day. And that sun was shining back on that truck. And, and where they were on the sidewalk, there was this huge shadow that the truck was making. And about the time they were coming out, the truck was starting to move. Well, the shadow was moving, and she saw it coming toward them. She said, look, Daddy, look at that big shadow. And it's just like and the Lord gave him that. He said, man, the Lord just right then, he said, he knew. And he said, honey, let me ask you a question. Would you rather be hit by the shadow of that truck or would you rather be hit by the truck? And she said, oh, Daddy, that's easy. I'd rather be hit by the shadow of that truck. And he said, that's right, honey, that's exactly right. And I'm going to tell you something. A few weeks ago when your mama died, the shadow hit her, but the truck hit Jesus when he died on the cross 2,000 years ago. That's exactly, that's exactly it. We go through the shadow of death. Listen, he experienced death for us. He, he went to the cross for us. He took the punishment of sin for us. He went through all that. He experienced the separation of God for us. He experienced all that. He took the truck when we take the shadow. That's what he's talking about there. The shadow of death. Well, let me close with these Three things, quick things. This was going to be my original outline, but we just had to add to it a little bit. Things to remember when facing death. Verse 4. All these come from the verse. First of all, if you're facing death, you have a loved one facing death, they've been through death, Listen, remember this truth, the presence of the shepherd. Notice what he says. I fear no evil. Why? You were with me. The first thing is the presence of the shepherd. 
you are with me. What, what, what a tremendous blessing. Not just the presence of the shepherd, but the power of the shepherd. Notice what he says. I fear no evil. You're with me. That's the presence of the shepherd. Your rod and your staff, that's the power of the shepherd. Your rod. Remember we said last week the rod protects the sheep. The staff draws them closer. So when you go through the valley of the shadow of death, listen, God's gonna, Jesus is going to protect you. You're a good shepherd. He's going to protect you. He's going to draw you close to himself. The presence of the shepherd, the power of the shepherd, but the purpose of the shepherd. Notice what it says. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And it's more than just comfort. It's really the purpose of the shepherd is, yes, he's going to comfort you as you go through that valley. But the whole idea is, remember what we said, that, that it's, it's the valley of the shepherd started up there and it went down, 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 all the way down there. The, the whole purpose is I'm going to take you to the place you need to be. I'm going to take you to another place. God is saying, I am with you. My power is with, with you. You have my presence. You have my power. And my purpose is to take you from point A to point B. And here's the thing I would, I would say this, and I'll be through. David knew enough about being a shepherd that the shepherd was not going to get up and get all those sheep together and take them and, and take this journey and listen, and go through a valley like that with the danger, uh, with, with all the things they faced. He knew a shepherd was not going to take his sheep through that valley unless he was taking them to a better place. Amen? Amen? He was taking them to a better and David had no doubt done that many, many times. And what he's saying, what I am to my sheep, my good shepherd, the Lord Jesus, is to me. And listen, we're going to go through that valley, but he said the only reason we're going through that valley is because our shepherd is taking us to a better place. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll bring comfort to our hearts from this passage today. Wow, we, just, we thank you. Lord, we look at death and we, we, it frightens us, it scares us. We, we try to dress it up. And, but Lord, you've said that even in those uncertain times, um, Lord, times when the devil wants to cause us to fear and be anxious, that you, you come right alongside us. We have the presence of our good shepherd. We have the power that you, listen, he has lost the battle. Sin is defeated. Death is defeated. You've been raised from the dead. Hallelujah, glory to your name. The power of our shepherd is absolute. And the comfort, Lord, is that you are bringing us to a better place. And that's your purpose. We thank you for that today. I pray that it will bring comfort to hearts here today, reassurance to hearts here today, that you may help them, that they may help others. And Lord, all we know to do, I, I think in my heart, all I can do is bow before you and say, thank you, thank you, thank you, that you would love me like you do, and that you have my good in your heart, and every person in this place can say that. I pray that today, if there's someone that can't honestly say, the Lord is my shepherd, today would be the day they'd say yes to you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.